everyone, welcome. Um, this is the favorite, my favorite part of my job is uh, introducing us all to these great artists that we can bring in here and they'll talk to us and answer our questions. Today, we have one of my personal favorites, Sandra Lee Phipps. Sandra is based in Atlanta. Um, she, you know, I knew Sandra when she was a photojournalist in not like a shooting car crashes and football games photojournalist, but in... <laughs> A uh, photojournalist for the, uh, the Village Voice, a big weekly newspaper uh, in New York City that was very influential at the time. Um, and, you know, I knew her work then and I, I resonated with it. She had a powerful ability to make portraits of everyday people that really had this resonance to them. Um, and then I lost track of Sandra. And then years later, we get back together and she is this kind of compelling fine artist. And it seems like she had kind of left that kind of very literal path of journalism, photojournalism behind, but she was still tapping into those skills, making these photographs that seemed just very magical to me. And, you know, trying to come up with the words that describe Sandra's work is, is, is challenging and fun. <laughs> you know, and I think we shared it in class the other day and we realized how challenging it is to really put words to these photographs, you know, into these images, but I tried. And uh, a couple words that, you know, immediately kind of come to mind are raw storytelling. Uh, the images kind of all look like they came out of sometimes like a, a kind of fairy tale. And by fairy tale, um, I'm acknowledging the darkness that comes with fairy tales, you know, where kids get chased through the forest and put in an oven and turned into pies and stuff like that. And uh, so, you know, fairy tales. And then there's the word feral that always comes to mind with Sandra's work. And it has a raw messiness. And, you know, people think of feral cats, this kind of wild creature, just that word feral, where the pictures seem raw and untamed and emotional. And, you know, those were the things that to me, no matter what she seems to point her camera at, um, it, you know, those qualities exist. And chatting with Sandra a little bit today as we were getting ready for this, she brought up the word uh, fecund. <laughs> Stop. And I tried to, I tried to look it up because I didn't even know what it meant, fecund. And Sandra, how would you use, how would you describe fecund? It means like giving birth to an unlimited amount of ideas or something like that. Yeah, or right? like a full, like full of things. Um, you know, sometimes people call pregnant women fecund, you know, you could say that. Um, so yeah, I guess that I, I've had people use that word before to me about it. And I love that word. When we, you know, I was talking, uh, when we were discussing the videos, when I showed, or the multimedia pieces, when I showed them, a lot of women, and it never had occurred to me at all, but a lot of women thought that they were about childbirth. <laughs> and I was like, Okay, that makes sense, because it was not, you know, it, it's a memorable experience, and uh, the kind of like the struggle, struggle is a word people come up with too. Struggle and then some type of release, you know. Yes. No, I yes. would say all those things yes. are in the work. The, um, for sure. And now to preface this before we turn it all over to Sandra, Sandra got in a terrible car accident. Yeah, <laughs> um, you want to see? There you go. Oh my goodness, uh, that looks terrible. Yeah. Um, and so I will be running the slides and the, the multimedia stuff that we're gonna share here. And Sandra will be kind of directing me from there. But yeah. um, before we get into all of these things, what exactly happened to you, Sandra, to give us some context? <laughs> well, <clears throat> okay, it's, it's been my, my friend who, uh, Vanessa, the, the woman in the pictures, uh, is also a former nurse and she came to take care of me last weekend and she said it's such a good southern gothic story because I was picking up a, a, a cake for for Forrest and Elizabeth who have retired and we were having our retirement party that night and I went to go get the cake and they said what do you want on it and I said congratulations and then I thought well that's boring how about bon voyage and so <laughs> I had a cake in the, in the passenger seat that said Bon Voyage when I got hit. And um, after, I don't remember some of it um, at all. And my car kind of went out of control and I used the emergency brake to save myself, but that's what broke this. And um, 
but I kept, I was laying on the ground in the rain, kind of like these pictures. And uh, this woman came up and I kept telling her, make sure you get the cake. I've ruined the party. <laughs> That was the first thing that yeah. yeah I was like, to you. get the cake. You've got to get the cake. And she's like, that's such a southern woman thing to do. I was like, don't let them tow the car with the cake. And uh, and then Sue Ellen sent me a picture of it that night, and it had survived completely. <laughs> but I was like, thank goodness I didn't go with a, a cake in my car that said Bon Voyage. Or if I did, <laughs> at least that's a good story. <laughs> that is an excellent story. Yeah. Um, and with that, let's all welcome Sandra Lee Phipps to uh, the Academy of Art University. Yes, hello, hello. Hi. Sandra, everybody. thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> yes, I'm a, I'm a little, you know, whatever you want to call it, spacey. Uh, it's been two weeks to the day, actually, since I had this happen. And, oh, that's um, very recent. Yeah, and I must say the airbags, uh, you know, definitely did their job because my face is fine. But um, yeah, um, Helga. Wow. So before we get into the pictures, you know, I know of you as a photojournalist, and but a lot of the students, you know, they've only seen your fine artwork. Uh -huh. Can you give us a little background into how you got started with photography? Like, how, how did this all begin? Um, I went to UGA. Um, uh, I, okay, I, I always tell this story to my students and, and you know, no, no, no uh, harm meant. But when I was a young girl, I always said I wanted to be a photographer. And then every year my parents would give me an Ansel Adams ca ca calendar for Christmas. And I'd be like, no, this is not what I want to do. And I was like, you know, determined that somewhere out there was somebody doing something else with photography. And then I went to UGA and I met a bunch of artists and, you know, started looking at the Village Voice and learning about photography and Cindy Sherman and Deanne Arvis. And then I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And actually, and Jim Goldberg, the first photo book I ever bought was Jim Goldberg's Rich and Poor. And I was like, oh, wow, this is what you can do with photography. Oh, and, so influential that book was. Uh, no, I, he's, he's the god. And um, so then I was determined, I, you know, I had to go, I had to be practical, but I put myself through college. I wasn't that kid that wasn't doing that. And I waitressed and I decided I had to get something practical. So I got a photojournalism degree, but I thought photojournalism kind of was like, eh. but I had to, you know, cause football games, stuff like that. But um, then I started doing portraits and, uh, I realized something about celebrity because I was uh, friends with the guys in REM. I lived in a house with them. And um, I went to New York City with Michael and I took a portrait of him for my portrait class in journalism. And I got an A plus. <laughs> and I was just like, all right, that works. And uh, I was kind of like learning how to use my camera while they were learning how to play music. And so, and actually their single was, is re-released today, 40 days to the day today, their first 45. Um, and I got a copy of it in the mail this morning, um, but I learned how to take pictures literally, or how to use my light meter by taking their pictures. Cause they were like, well, we need pictures, but we don't know how to do this. And so that's what I did. And I'm the only one of them that graduated from school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. Of all my friends, I stayed in school. But the one thing I always say is that I was always doing two things at once because I learned about pinhole photography in the art school. I really wanted to be in the art school. So I would take classes in the art school with Michael and a lot of my, my, my other friends. And, um, but I graduated with a journalism degree because I knew I needed to be practical and pay the bills. Right. And my dream was to move to New York City and work at the Village Voice because I was, Sylvia Plahi was my goddess. Um, uh, and she, you know, she turned out to, she's a very good friend of mine and she's my mentor. I'm one of, and I always say to my students that mentors are very, very, very important. And she taught me that I could be my own weirdo self and still be a successful photographer. Because when I moved to New York, I was, you know, I could have worked at Warner Brothers because I was helping to manage REM. I could have done all these things. And instead, I said, I want to wait tables and be a photographer. <laughs> and um, I was sometimes assisting for these like well-known 
I can't even remember their names, photographers, like rock photographers. Cause I, and then I was like, this is awful. Like, I don't want to, you know, yell at people and uh, you know, I don't know. I just felt like photographers seemed kind of like not nice people. And then I met Sylvia and I realized, oh, you can be, you know, yourself and still have a photography career. And Amy Arbus as well, Deanne Arbus's daughter worked at The Voice and I got to know her and she's a fantastic person. She's just fantastic. Oh, great photographer. Yeah. yeah. Oh, she's amazing. And, um, but they taught me that you don't have to be that kind of like prototype of the, you know, uh, oh, I shouldn't say that, but um, uh, <laughs> that you don't have to be that, you know, thing. And so I decided, like Sylvia told me, she never used an assistant. She would never have anybody around when she did photographs. And um, so I just started shooting that way, kind of in her, she taught me I could do that. And so that's what I did. And when you're a journalist, you don't really, when you're on the streets, you can't really have somebody with you anyway. So I never did. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, that's fascinating. Um, so it sounds like it, that was kind of like you went to college to do, be a photographer. You found like a functional form of photography that you could do. And then you kind of went to New York to make that happen. Does that sound accurate? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one of my proudest things was that I was able to kind of combine things like Holga cameras with journalism, mm -hmm. <laughs> which Sylvia did for, I mean, I have to say, I give her credit. But, um, you know, I learned that I could do informative work with weird cameras. And like I, I eventually did a self-portrait, which is what I did in the art school, self-portrait pinholes. Uh, I, I did a cover for the Village Voice that was a self-portrait pinhole. And I was like, all right. But I was it was also I was covering the women's um, action. It's called WAC. It was like a feminist movement. And so the photographs were very newsworthy, but they let me do my own version of them uh, with a pinhole. And I thought that was kind of cool. It's like combining everything. Right, right. Wow, so did you always have like one foot in like the functional yeah. use of photography and then one foot in the yeah. kind of more esoteric art yeah, stuff? Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I've am I'm, always supported myself and that's just what I do. So that's how I did it. But I always kind of tried to sneak in the art stuff Right. You know? And then, right. yeah. And, and now, you know, being a photojournalist takes, you have to say yes. Every, like then I started freelancing for the times and you, to get on the top of their list, you say yes, every single time they call you. And I have a student now who is on the top of their list. I have two of them that I say, I think are going to get Pulitzers or should um, for the coverage in, um, Minneapolis, Joshua Rashad McFadden, and then one here in Atlanta who's coming to my house tonight, Nicole Crane. She's done all the, the New York Times coverage of the elections here in Georgia. And she made a really smart move to relocate because she knew there was nobody here that they were gonna use so much. And, um, but I also see how hard they work. You cannot say no. You say yes every time and you do what they need immediately and the turnaround on journalism is very different than something like a magazine job for example oh yeah oh yeah yeah and so i got tired of that at a certain point and i had a um i had a baby uh and so i started i went to nyu and got a graduate degree in in what they called studio art and it was the first it was right before they started giving out, uh, uh, allowing you to get MFAs. And um, I studied with Barbara S who just died actually. She's an amazing oh. pinhole photographer. Barbara S and Peter Campus, who's like a video artist from the seven, like with William Wegman. And, um, and I went there because they had, um, oh God, what is his name? Uh, Taurus, I can't remember his first name right now. Um, and he died of AIDS uh, the, the year I started school there. Um, but it was a good program because they didn't teach you photography. No one did photographs. So it was like the, the, the early 90s. And it was like not cool to take pictures in photo school. You know, people <laughs> did everything else. 
And so um, I liked it because they weren't, it wasn't about technique, it was about ideas and what you're looking at. And so I did things like I made pillows with my face on them and I had environmental pieces. I was pregnant, I got pregnant the first week of graduate school. And so my, my thesis was um, pinholes of my body. Mm. That, and I used the first version of Photoshop. And I remember when I showed someone one that I put an image on top of another image from a book and like everybody came around to look at it. <laughs> they were like, wow, right. and, you know, it, it was on a floppy disk. Oh, we had, yeah, we had one computer and we all shared it. Right, right. In our apartment, yeah. Right, no, it was like that. You'd go to the computer lab, mm -hmm. um, you know, and book time with these things. Yeah, and then Peter Campus hired me because uh, he liked what I was doing. And um, he, he, that was my first teaching job. And so I taught at NYU after I graduated. Oh, oh, interesting. So now, just to bring us down up to the present day, uh, you are a professor where? Oh, the Savannah College of Art and Design in Atlanta, though, not in Savannah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. How long have you been there? <laughs> Forever. No, 13 years. Oh, seriously. That's great. Yeah, 13 years. That's yeah. wonderful. So, yeah. you know, in preparing for your, you know, your lecture, I came across this uh, this PDF of a project that are uh, that I loved, and it was so elaborate, and it was in depth. And um, you called it Helga. And Does anyone out there know who Helga is? I think of a painter. Yes, I just want to know if anyone has ever heard of Helga. I've met Helga. I took a picture of Helga herself. <laughs> Let's see, Adrian Pau, can you tell us who Helga is? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the, the red-headed subject in the paintings by um, um, Andrew? Andrew. Andrew Hyatt. Hyatt. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just pulled that up. I'm yeah. very impressed. Yeah. <laughs> I got pop mm -hmm. quiz answer. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Yeah, Helga. And she, it was a secret, yeah. you know? It was like a... He painted her for I don't know how many years, and no one had ever seen these paintings. And it was like something they did, even though you know she was his neighbor and his wife was home all the time. Somehow they mm -hmm. did these these amazing paintings, and no one knew he had done them. Wow, I didn't know that part of the and story. It, no, it was she was on the cover of Time magazine. The mm -hmm. paintings were because it was the biggest mystery in the art world. Mm -hmm. um, and she lives in Maine, where I go every summer, and so. They have a Wyeth day and sometimes she comes, sometimes she doesn't. She's beautiful. She's still beautiful. She's a much older woman. She's still got these piercing blue eyes. And I had arranged to go do portraits with her, but I haven't, you know, who knows if that will happen, but I've taken pictures of her at, at these events and she's, she's kind of mysterious. She won't talk. You kind of have to go through some level of like, oh, you're okay. <laughs> oh, she has to approve. Yeah, you have to get her approach. approval. Because <laughs> a lot of people want to take, I think, you know, see her. Um, but yeah, that's the, the thing about it is, and so I always called these girls the Helgas because they looked like her when they were young. Uh, they're identical twins. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's so, where the, the, I always called them the Helgas because they always wore these big braids and, you know, she had braids in those paintings and everything in Maine looks like a Wyeth painting. I mean, the Wyeths are what it's all about up there and they live on an island. I have a, one of my babysitters babysat for Jamie Wyeth as well. You know, they're everywhere up there. Interesting. So let's, yeah. let's read this little introduction here and I can read it. If you'd like. Will you only because my eyes are not 100% right now. Yeah, for sure. Helga is a series of images created over the summer months. Mm -hmm. Interweaving archetypal images with a symbolic color of power, protection, and danger, the work explores the fragile sense of the self, the unknown of protection. The process of photographing two girls in the landscape reveals a tension a story emerges between what is known and unknown in all relationships in times of transition. Positive mind, negative mind, a 
Struggle for Balance. Helga was created as part of a larger body of work entitled Safe, presented in conjunction with a series of self-portraits on the same theme. And so with all those words in mind, I wanted to just kind of introduce the class to this body of work. Okay. Um, and why don't we look at them all and then we'll go back and you can kind of uh, give us a little narration because I really saw them as like a whole, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of tells a little story. I did do them over a series of summers. Um, it was something I worked on for a few years. How long do you think you worked on this? Well, I'm trying to, for the girls, probably maybe two summer, three summers, maybe. Um, so they grew up a little bit. Uh, now they're adult, adults. They're in, co they're out of college even. Um, uh, but the self portraits were the thing that I did first. And then these were kind of like, I, I wanted to do something that was more of a story of almost like the prequel to the, to the kind of more solitary self portraits. Right. Right. No, that's interesting. And, and then, I was, you know, I'm a mom. And so here's the thing I always say to my women students is like, just like when I was pregnant in graduate school, I had to do something. So I had to use what my life was about because I couldn't kind of get away from being extremely pregnant. And um, so I took a constraint and made it into what I was doing. And so I was always with these kids because I was with their mom as my best friend. And so we just started playing around with ideas and they were just home on this farm all day long. It's a farm way out in the middle of nowhere in Maine. And um, so we just started doing these pictures and they loved it. Cause they, you know, they just, you know they love these animals, like they were their friends. And, uh, and so we just started kind of wandering around their landscape and taking pictures when we felt like it. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it has this feeling of like, they'll, they'll just do whatever you want them to do. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they loved it. Yeah. They're actually now they're like models for this woman named Rudy. Uh, oh God, her name, Rudy Judeco. If you see her on Instagram, she, she uses them as, you know, models and they don't have typical bodies or anything. That's what I love about them. Cause they're just real, you know, girl, women, you know, they don't wear makeup. They're just beautiful because they're themselves, you know? Mm. And then I use this orange, that's something I actually had in my car when I just had my accident. Um, I carry it with me wherever I go, this flag. And um, I love shooting through it because it, it creates, you know, like a, an atmosphere. Like, see, to me, that's a very Wyeth looking thing. Although the Wyeth work is always very male. Um, uh, that's the one difference I would say is I, I'm, I was always very influenced by Justine Kurland and you know her work, Girls. Um, and so I wanted to do some sort of, I don't know, story of women or girls in a landscape where they're kind of discovering something about themselves through the landscape, but not landscape, not Ansel Adams. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> that I love Ansel Adams now. I have a whole, now I appreciate him. Yeah, so I, I was always trying to overcome the digital camera because these are digital. Mm -hmm. And I don't like how perfect things are in digital cameras. And so to me, the way to overcome it was to use these objects that I shoot through um, sometimes. And then sometimes I don't. And I, orange is my favorite color and it's the color of safety and protection. But the reason I started the first self-portraits was um, I was feeling a lot of, uh, you know, after 9-11, I had a baby and, you know, they kept talking about code orange was the alert of that day, right? Oh yeah. And I felt like everybody was talking about, are we safe? Can we be safe? Are things safe? And I thought it's interesting that the color of orange, it's also, you know, the, the monks wear orange as for protection. It's always been a color of protection, but now we're using it as a way to code our world, whether or not we're safe or not. 
And, um, and then I, the poncho to me is interesting because it's not really protecting you from anything except, you know, the elements sort of, but is it real, are you really safe in those things? Right. And then, you know, that, that's where that came from. And I also wanted to photograph my body without the way I did when I was pregnant without kind of presenting the perfect woman's body. Right. And um, anyway, yeah. So a couple of questions came in and again, I'll repeat what I often say is, um, you know, class and everyone who's here, put your questions in the chat as people already have begun. And as they seem appropriate, I'll, you know, kind of interrupt and present them. And then we'll have time at the end also to kind of engage with things. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of things I just want to read to you here, Sandra, that have come in that kind of echo what you were saying is, uh, let's see, I'm controlling the chat here. Uh, oh, Anna Rose says, love the flag shoot through. Uh, <laughs> and I love it too. I like just how it's such an analog way to mess with things. You yeah, know? yeah. Um, and then Ofer uh, student here says, orange is also the color of safety gear, safety cones, jackets. Is the orange representing safety here or is it completely not related? And I, th I think you answered. I just kind of answered addressed it. That. But, yeah. you know, also when you live in Maine uh, and my friend Erica on this farm, she would yell at me like, you have to put on your orange in the fall. There's this famous story, which we used to laugh about is like a woman went out to go hang up her mittens on the line and got shot to death. <laughs> because she didn't, you know, there's hunters everywhere, like on Erica's property in the fall, you have to even, you have to put orange on your dog or someone can, you know, you can, there's all kinds of accidental, you know, hunters shooting. And so you actually do wear orange up there in order to signify that you're moving out in the landscape, but you're not a deer, you know? Oh, wow. 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 <laughs> Wow. So, uh, um, yeah. Hey, here's a question that came in. Uh, a couple people. Anna Rose, uh, one of our students, says uh, she agrees modern mirrorless DSLRs are too clean and too perfect, yeah. uh, which I totally think so, too. Yeah. Um, but then uh, Mari, another student here, says, why digital if you don't prefer it? Why not stick with pinhole or stick with film? Like, why do you think you did it with digital? Because I was busy taking care of children, A. Oh, yeah. Pinhole and film takes another level of, uh, you know, steps, right? Oh, yeah. I was also trying to learn how to love it because I felt like I needed to learn how to love digital. Like, you know, come on. Um, I've developed, you know, I don't know how many thousands of rolls of film. I don't need <laughs> to do that anymore. Um, uh, so I wanted to see how you can kind of undo the perfection. And also... I liked that it was all done analog. Like this, none of this is, I don't like photo. I mean, I don't have a problem with Photoshop, but I don't, I rather um, create photographs in front of the camera than create them, you know, on the computer. And I work with someone who does the complete opposite. Like we work completely oppositely, but um, I wanted to see, cause I kind of photograph like, do you know, do you guys know who Larry Fink is? He was also someone, a, a photographer that I worked with at The Voice. And I learned, I used to go shoot things and watch him because we both used Mamiya Sixes. And he always told me like, you've got to shoot like a, a, a jazz musician. You got to use it. You got to move, you got to bend, you got to blah. And so I would, when I do this stuff, it's also, also very physical. Oh, you're juggling <laughs> things and holding stuff yeah, in front of yeah, the yeah, lens. Yeah, yeah, and, and I'm not knowing it's kind of the way pinhole is, you don't know what you're gonna get until you get it. And so I was trying to do that with a digital camera. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. bring that kind of element into it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, these are really beautiful to look at uh, a new- I mirror. have this one in my living room, actually. <laughs> well, that yeah. was gonna bring me to my question is at the time you were making these, you know, it has a strong storytelling vibe to it, you know, almost like it looks like you're tapping into your photojournalist skill set of telling a story, even yeah. though it's a story you're making up, I'm yeah. assuming, you know, 
What was your intention? Like, were you trying to have a show or do a book or just make cool photos or like, what was the goal? Uh, the goal was to see what I could do with a camera that told a story, I guess, that wasn't a journalistic story. Yeah. Yeah. And what's funny is I showed these to Sylvia and she called me immediately and she's like, you're breaking all the rules. You need to stop. These are color and blah, blah, blah. And then, then she decided she loved them, but yeah. you know, cause you know, her thing is that you have to be truthful and these are not a truth these are uh invented but they're invented in front of the camera so right. that's the difference to me it's not digital invention and um i also just wanted to take um i knew i had these girls that really like to perform in front of the camera and i wanted to see what i could do with them right, um right. and my daughter's actually in this as well sometimes she's one of them but you can't tell um and this is not this is not them. This is another friend of mine. And this is the picture I have right here on my um, right on my puja table. And um, that's the one I've sold the most, which I find so weird. Um, uh, I sold like four of those that when I had the show. For some reason people really respond to that. And that's just a reflection in water of a friend of mine, but I have a, I have various versions of this that I've never done in, I have lots of versions of these I've done nothing with. Mm. The, this one is different because it's so like iconic where the other ones are a little more like, there's a lot of things happening in them. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, this, this is very, like, very simple, you know? Um, but I guess it says a lot, especially to women, they really respond to this. Or I shouldn't say just women, but you know, uh, that's oh, what I there's found is my audience sometimes. Oh, strength, power. Yeah. Um, a transparency. Questioning, you know. questioning, not yeah. knowing, right? Um, and I don't know. Um, you know, eventually when I started to put the two things together as a show, I definitely was led a little bit by this idea of um you know, I, I, I'm a, that's my daughter, actually. She, we got in an argument and she's like, look, that's me. That's not them. And then I realized she's right. Um, but, uh, you know, this kind of, when I started laying these out, I realized that I had in my, without knowing, well, when I was in uh, graduate school, we read something called the myth of the birth of the hero by someone named Otto Rank. Mm -hmm. um, it was required reading. And then uh, uh, I know that I was kind of modeling uh, this idea of the heroes, but again, to me, it's a heroine, uh, the hero's journey. And that's how I came up with the titles for some of the, you know, not meaning to, but somehow I followed this idea of like, you know, this, like the self-portraits or the separation from the world and then the initiation uh, into the unknown world. And then the return, you know, from the experience. It's kind of like a storytelling, it's archetypes and storytelling. So oh, yeah. in graduate school, we had to, we learned a lot about archetypes and archetypal uh, psychological space. And so that's definitely what this stuff is, you know, these oh, images yeah. are. Uh, I can't remember, this one is, I love the name of this one, but I can't remember what it is right now. <laughs> it's like, mm. <laughs> It, it's like uh it's about the fish um, oh interesting we can look i think it's the title of it oh, is no, on your website no you know what it is it's called flies in the ointment isn't that a great name for that picture oh, oh that's wild because <laughs> it's kind of about the the ugliness of life you know um the imperfect nature of nature kind of that's what it seems like to me so a couple questions came in here, and one is the most obvious one. Uh, what was the significance of this? these repeated color-coded plastic ponchos, you know? <laughs> Just that I love them. I still have, uh, you know, I can't find the orange ones anymore. They're like disappeared, but um, you would wear those in Maine, uh, you know, to say, stay safe outside. I'm kid I kid you not, from hunters. And well, that's so the that's the orange, but you've got these perfect, like, 
yin and yang oh, colors though yeah. with the blue the, and the you know the second summer they didn't have the orange they only had the blue and i was like well that's kind of cool and i started playing with them so um i just thought it was cool that they had the complementary color and that also that these two women matched but didn't match you know oh, they're, yeah. they're they're identical but they're not identical and yeah. i can tell the difference even between the uh with the poncho on which one is which you know right even, even now and yeah. one of them was much more willing to be photographed uh, more often um it's kind of funny i think that's actually i, I got look at the feet I, I, that might be my daughter actually and this is at grand lake stream this is way this is somewhere else it's where i used to go every summer uh it's a fishing camp in the middle of nowhere and they would let us just do whatever we wanted up there. Mm. Actually, got, we got married there um, on, on that little bridge thing that you saw. And um, <clears throat> so we, I, we went up there and just photographed for like a week and of course swam and had fun. This is making me miss Maine. Yeah. Yeah, and but then... the significance is just that it, it's like, a, it, first of all, I felt for these girls that, you know, um, having them be nude would be a very different thing. And I didn't want to make them uncomfortable. And so I was nude when I did mine, but they are sometimes and not sometimes, but they felt a lot more comfortable in front of the camera with these kind of surf surfaces on. Mm. Mm. No, that makes sense. That Here's makes a, couple, sense? a couple of questions um, the, that I'll share with you now. Um, are you familiar with the work of Alessandra Sanguinetti that oh, she yeah. has done the, of these two cousins? And it's gotten a lot of attention. I think a book just came out this year. Isn't, um, is, isn't she Jim Goldberg's boo? Oh, I don't know. They're, they're a couple, oh. <laughs> I think. I don't know if we should indulge in gossip here. Um, <laughs> no, but she's like a, so she's a storyteller too but in a whole different way, because those are very documentary in nature. Very but much she, so. She, but she does, but she does uh, collaborate with them. You know, I think those are collaborations too. You know, kind of in the same way that Sally Mann's pictures, when people bring them in as documentary work, I'm like, you are, you are off the mark here. These are recreations of moments. And she even talks about that that you know something happens and then she goes back and re kind of configures it a little bit for a photograph and i don't know how much of uh alexandra's stuff is done that way but it looks to me like the girls do collaborate with her and these girls did other things with me <clears throat> that are you know reality based but i didn't use them mm, right this you is know. your own fairy tale that you're this telling is my own fairy tale yes yeah uh, you know, I'm kind of curious here. Is this the first time you created a, a whole fiction story? Well, no, because I, when I was in graduate school, I had a, I made a book uh, of my images of myself <clears throat> that are kind of a story about birth, I guess. <clears throat> so I would say that was a story, but it wasn't straightforward either. Right, right. Um, <laughs> Right. I guess I refuse to be straightforward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, Here's a question here. Let's see. Um, another one I want to feed to you. Uh, can you speak to the use of titles? Some photographers don't name their photos. Some give them a simple title. You use a line and often it's, a po it's poetic or it's a riddle-like title. Can you expand on this topic? Well, I think that titles are very important. I always tell my students that um, untitled is so boring. Um, <clears throat> I love Alex Soth's stuff about titles. You know, like if the Ameri the Americans, if it was just called America, you no, know, he's like, that's the most boring title for that book that's possible. <laughs> the Americans? Like, you know, yeah, yeah. But like he said, if I called my book um, Pictures of the Mississippi, would you really want to look at it? But when I call it sleeping by the Mississippi, it becomes mysterious. But um, 
Uh, I, I title a lot of things after songs that I'm listening to or songs, music. I have a lot of music in my life and my past. And so um, music uh, is what I used sometimes. Like I did these whole, you don't, you've never seen these, these really abstract images and I title them after Sonic Youth songs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so these uh, titles kind of came after, when I laid out the show, and I saw what they what they were. Um, that's when I realized, oh, this is the hero's journey, and so that's where those titles come from. There's <clears throat> various stops on the hero's journey, and I used a version of each of those um, for all of these pictures, you know. And that's why they have like the flies in the ointment is about the trouble in life, and that's a that's a name from Joseph Campbell's The Hero's Journey. And they are riddles because I like them. I write poetry too, but I don't do anything with it. But um, I, I don't. I, I, I like to think of images as poems. Like they're not. They're they live in and of themselves. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so the titles give you a clue to what the artist is thinking, but you can think whatever you want to think. Just like just like music. Music is the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I do want to say something that I, you know, I haven't been able to read or I, and I can't, I can't, uh, I haven't been, I, I usually would read if I was stuck in bed and I'm, I'm not supposed to. So the only thing I've been able to do is listen to music. And uh, I started watching that McCartney 321. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. my yeah. God, it's so good. And it's all about collaboration and creativity. And I'm going to use that for my classes uh, in the fall for sure. But like the way you see how Paul McCartney, when he talks about how they, I'm not a Beatles freak, but yes, I am, because that was the first album I ever owned, um, was Meet the Beatles. And, um, but I love talking about like songs are, are you know, they're not, they're not, um, they're not exact. There's nothing exact about them. They want to put you in a mood and that's it. You know, like Norwegian Wood, it's my favorite song. Oh, yeah. It just, it tells a story, but what story does that really tell? Right. right. <laughs> so that's, that's what these are supposed to be like for me. They're little yeah. Oh, there's some story there. Yeah, we're not sure exactly what it is, but it has all those like kind of narrative qualities that keep you to it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's why I that's what these are supposed to be doing. You know, because you can't tell people what to think when they I mean you can with documentary photographs, you can try, you can be much more direct. And I was trying to do the opposite of that after working as a journalist for so long. Mm. Um that I would say that's one of the things. And um this picture scares everybody. Um, oh yeah. My, yeah, that's my daughter. And it's not supposed to look. I have a picture of her as a newborn baby in a pinhole in the same spot. And it's a beautiful photograph, but in graduate school, it scared everyone. It's like a baby in a basket right on the edge of the river. And yeah, um, yeah, I <laughs> that picture, even her, she's like, why did you never just take pictures of me? Like, why, <laughs> why am I doing that? But she's supposed to look like she's resting, but I realize she looks like she's not resting like she's fighting or she's dead and There's i didn't a know, there. you know like uh twin peaks or something but that's not what it was supposed to read as but again you can't control that um and i noticed a lot of people when i had this show uh people looking at the work had all kinds of different reactions to it than what i was intending right which I like. yeah 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 uh here's a question uh from bowen he says in this project, I can feel the fairy tale calmness in some of the images, while the uh, while there is a feeling of unease in the others. Is this intentional when you shot them, or echoing the concept when you processed and selected the images? Well, that's complicated. Yeah. Um, I just shot what I wanted to do that day. I wasn't following like a script. I don't. You know, like I know people that draw out everything they're gonna do, and then oh they, yeah, storyboard it. Yeah, you know, I, don't, sure. I don't, I don't do that. I just start doing. I'm very much like that. I don't. That's why you know, um, yeah, I shoot a lot because I just shoot what I 
feel like that day. And then when I start to put the stuff to get like, my gallerist had very strong opinions about what I did. And so she took a lot of stuff out that I loved and then, but she was right. Like, um, you know, less is more. You always tell people that. I always tell people that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think this picture was in the show, but God, why can't I remember if it was? This one wasn't, um, for example. She thought it looked like fashion, not, not mm -hmm. a part of the story. Yeah, with the legs and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And that's the three of them. You can see I had my daughter and the two of them. That oh, I, was yeah. gonna, I was gonna introduce a new character and then I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. But I tried mm -hmm. it, you know. Right, right. The, um, uh, then just a comment from Anna Rose. She said, I love how you pull personal inspiration for your photography from all the areas of your life. Mm -hmm. um, have you always done that? Because there's lots of recommend. I mean, you're always acknowledging like, well, this kid was born at this time. So therefore I did this. And this is what was <laughs> happening in the nation at the time. And that's why I did this. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I still do it. Um, I feel like that is what makes things art kind of is like, you don't, you're not inspired by one thing, you're inspired by everything. And I mean, I've been a mom, I'm still a mom, but you know, that's been <laughs> a big part of my life for many, many years. And so it's like, you can either fight it or you can start using it. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, there's been so much, you know, uh, you know, as you know, work done with people and their kids. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to make it about them. Right. I wanted to make them represent something else. And I've done, I've photographed both, you know, my son doesn't like being photographed, but um, my daughter has been a willing victim for a long time and, you know, but she's moving away next week. So that's over. But like I photographed her on her trampoline. I mean, uh, when she was 16, it's still back there. And, um, I didn't even realize it's like, she used to meet her boyfriend on that trampoline. So that picture means something very different to her, but it's, it's very it's not obvious what the picture is because I'm shooting through the trampoline, just like right. that. Yeah. It's oh yeah, I no, I love that. I want them trampoline. to represent ideas. I don't, I, you know, I'm not trying to tell the story of my kids. I don't think that's fair, you know? Mm. Cause that's, you know, that's their life. Oh, that's their story. Yeah, so that's why kind of more the costuming or something for this, because yeah. I didn't, you know, these were young girls. They're like 12 or 13 you know oh yeah i love love this. this image this one wasn't in the show i've right. never done anything with this i want to i would love to make a book out of this actually um absolutely maybe that's what i'll do while i have the rest of my summer off <laughs> <laughs> the um and so we'll finish this oh and this is the end and so you know what I wanted to do here, and that was beautiful. I love that. I love that entire series with every moment. Like I like seeing these images that you very rarely show that are almost, they're a little more like portraits of the girls, you know? Yeah, I love, I love that one. The one with the, that. Like that, that's their back door. I love that light. I love that light. Yeah. Totally love those two. And then the strong red and the strong blue and how all those things work. And so, you know, it's interesting. What I wanted to do now is because, you know, you had an exhibit of this and in exhibiting this work, it really changed pretty radically. Would you agree? Oh yeah, definitely. Because I had to put this, this with the other work. I had, I had big plans. Cause I also did a whole room of, I did at a performance at a performer that pretended, you know, she was, she was in the poncho nude. Yeah. Um, I created a room with all the wool from all those sheep. Um, and so I had big plans for all. I had to put a lot of complicated, weird things together, but it seemed to make sense when I did it. So, I mean, to talk about this, when you exhibit this work, which isn't really documentary work at all, you, it yeah. sounds like you are you're combining different projects that you had to kind of make one whole project. Then there's like a multimedia type of thing that mm -hmm. is an extension of the project in some way. Yeah. What's there? Experience. Are you trying to get as far away from straight photography as possible, but still like <laughs> doing Probably. straight photography? 
I'm not Ansel Adams. No, I'm sorry. Um, I, I, I wanted, I want people to have an experience. Oh, Felix Gonzalez Torres is the artist that I was loving in the eighties. Um, and I loved his way. Like he had, he's the person who put like a pile of candy in the middle of the gallery and you were asked to take it. Like, I like the idea of, of doing all of those things where people have an experience when they, cause I think photographs on a wall can be just, it's just rectangles, you know, I want people to have an experience when they're walking through it. So I guess I'm kind of interested in sculpture. In fact, I, I am interested in sculpture. I just don't have the time to really, so that was my approach to it. Right. Do you think we should show one of these videos to give the students an idea of yeah. just that yeah. aspect of things? And they were just on a repeated loop and you had to go into this small, tiny room and watch them one at a time from across the room. You couldn't get close to them. And the, the one I think you're going to show was shot with a, um, with my iPhone. So should we show oh. hold still and keep going or the ultimate so that's, shot, that's shot while I'm walking across that crazy bridge. That's just with a regular DSLR. Let's try performing safely. Yeah. Um, is my is my screen shared being shared? Yeah, I can I can see it. So this is All what right. it looked like in the gallery. And this is the little uh uh now they make it's called shed space but she hadn't used it before i started using it um and this is the woman performing her name's stephanie Farr, and she was amazing she won some sort of award for her uh, you know uh, in atlanta for performance from for this so they got the raincoats and everything and then where is I, the shed? I, I did all this i spent a couple of days making this room for her to be in and then she wandered around the gallery and she did all these ritualistic things. And then she climbed a tree nude, which was, <laughs> was I don't think anyone had done that in Atlanta in a while. Um, right. She's beautiful. And she was one of my students. And uh, we were gonna work together again, but um, I haven't done it yet. She's a pretty amazing, really dedicated performance artist. This is very beautiful and it feels almost exactly like your photos, you know. Yeah. Um she got but it. a little Yeah, she nailed it. Yeah, she really did. How did this how was this received? Oh, I told you. She was like they it was the talk of the town, you know, and then she was upset because people were acting like it was hers kind of and you know, it's that's like saying a dancer's uh dance is their dance but the choreographer is usually who's you know credited with it <laughs> but i didn't you know it's just like she's performing safely that's what i called it you know um but you know she got a lot of it it was you know very well received that's really beautiful i really love how you try you know we're able to kind of bring this one thing to life almost you know what I mean? yeah that's what i wanted to do so thank you no, oh, no, absolutely, absolutely exciting. So why don't we look at how, can you, uh, we're going to look at how this was edited down to a show. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about, like, I'm used to something that tells the story in many pieces. And it sounds like your gallerist, when she turned this into a show, was really about keeping things unspoken, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. And she's really good at knowing what belongs in her space. And so she was very particular that the self portraits were the first thing you saw. And then the mystery of, you have to walk through a doorway to go into the other room and see the other photographs. And that they make you ask questions because it's like, well, what comes first? Or are these things related and how are they related? Because obviously, and the, the self portraits were done with a four by five camera. So they look different, you know, they're different type of imagery. Right. Um, and uh and so i was gonna combine them and she was very specific that the one room was kind of like the prequel or or the you know kind of the call to adventure or the call to the journey or it could be after the journey it's all up to the person's um response to them 
Hmm. You want to, you want me to go through these now and you can kind of talk about how this changed when it became a show. Um, yeah, sure. The, um, and so are you seeing uh, this one picture? Are you seeing the problem? Yeah, I'm seeing the, yeah. So uh, what we're going to see is the edit of the show that the, uh, that, mm -hmm. you know, your gallerist created. Yeah. That one, a lot of people like that one too. Um, it's a favorite of mine. <laughs> this is an example of a print that didn't work when I, I love this image, but when I printed it, it doesn't work. Really? As a big photograph. No, I still have it, but it didn't end up in the show. Oh, I love that one with you all thought its thought it was splendor. too abstract. You know, this one I've sold a few of. Um, mm -hmm. And they, it was a two piece image. There's this and then the picture with the, the flag in front of it. Those two were hung together. They're, they're shot like that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, they go next to each other on a wall. Oh, nice. Uh -huh. Nice. And I can't, again, I, I'm kind of slow a little bit with the names right now, but that I, I have titles that are all parts of the hero's journey. Um, right. And that's, and these, this one didn't go in, or maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think this one was in the show because I had them together for a long time. And she's like, no, 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 that's too much. <laughs> Interesting. So this one, and this image scares people. I had it up at SCAD for a while and people were just like, oh, it's so creepy. But I don't think it's scary. It looks like a Madonna to me. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I've loved that photo for a long and time. And I love this one. This one's called Supernatural Aid, which is like the thing that comes out of, when you're on a journey, there's something that helps you along that you don't know what it is. Um, and that's what this, that's why that's called supernatural aid. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, so a uh, couple questions here as we kind of look at this. Um, uh, Orlando, he says, what is your approach to directing your models? Do you give them any clear direction of what to do or let them be in the environment and for them to do what they choose? Um, both. I do both. Um, sometimes if I see something and I decide I want to redo it, we, we, we do it. A lot of times we would always choose, you know, of course, the golden hour to go out and photograph. And sometimes they get distra <laughs> distracted because uh, they're two girls. They'd start fighting or something <clears throat> or they, you know, get all into their animals. Mm -hmm. And I'll take photographs of them or not. Um, I also have movies that I made of them, like setting up this perimeter of uh, a, an electric fence around the the farm. But you know, like I don't know when I'm doing it, what's going to be, what's going to work. But I knew I liked this, and so. Um, uh, but it was just in the moment, like they just they're really good at wandering around, and they knew when I was doing it that they just start doing things, and I'd start photographing them. But if there was something that I really liked, I might ask them to do it again. And like this right. one, for example, they had to, um, I had to get in the water to take it. And, um, you know, I knew that I wanted it to look like I was in the water with them. Mm. And mm. so, you know, they had to be pretty patient. They were freezing by the time it was over. It's cold right. in the water in Maine. <laughs> oh yeah. And then a question from Adrian here. She says, uh, did you find particular challenges that you could elaborate on when converting your photographic vision, vision to like a gallery installation? Um, no, not, I mean, uh, I mean, I had, to, I had to let go of things and, and eliminate images because, you know, shows are hard because they're expensive to frame. And these are big prints um, and, you know, I, I had to let go of things, That's, you know, like, what do we call it? Killing your babies. Oh, um, yeah. You know, oh, I actually meant the, um, the performance art installation that you, the, that you built the, the small cabin that you had your student do the performance art in. Uh -huh. Yeah. What, Doing, what about? Oh, I was curious because it's a different medium. It's 3d versus, mm -hmm. and it's interactive versus, you know, photography, which is, just a, 
Oh, I had more Different fun media. with that. See, I think I, I don't always have so much fun with photography these days. Sometimes. <laughs> so that was fun you for me. I mean, that. I spent days like filling that thing with stuff and, you know, Stephanie came over there and we just wandered around together and she, um, and, and it smelled really funky um, mm -hmm. from the sheep's wool and the candles and I had a sound, I had sound in the, in the cabin. So um, I'm just saying that that wasn't a challenge. That was fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, I had to be told to stop. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Oh, no, that's awesome. Uh -huh. So, you know, we're looking and now here, this is you though, correct? Yeah, this is me four by five color film. This is where I used to live. This was the, the, the yard in, uh, before we moved to Atlanta, this was where I was. And so I was kind of stuck, you know, I felt very stuck there. And so I was, okay, um, I'm gonna start doing these self portraits and I wanted them to be big, you know? And, um, and so I was kind of performing this way myself just to, you know, kind of, begin this project because like I said my friend told me that Native American saying because I was saying what is all this about saying that we're safe if we're safe if we do this we safe if we're safe if we do that and it's like what is that really about like what what are we fearing so much in our cult you know the culture of fear just felt like it was everywhere in mm -hmm. that period of time and I thought you know, I want to do these images that kind of replicate, you know, how I, how I felt as a person with a young child and this whole idea of like, you know, my children at that point, because they had learned so much to be afraid of. And I mean, look at where we are now. This was after 9-11 and we thought, oh my God, nothing, you know, like that. Well, that is just so awful. But, you know, it seems like that was just the beginning of this culture well america has always had a culture of fear but um that that this whole idea of like coding existence and trying to protect yourself from other people you know what are you really protecting yourself from because really it's yourself right that's mm -hmm. to me that's the idea right right interesting so just to kind of put everything in context, these were done, the ones of you solo in four by five were done before you got together with the teenagers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I had this idea to do them, but I had to only work, you know, I only had so much time and then I moved. And then that next summer, I didn't see them again for a year. And the next summer I started doing those things. And then I worked on it. I got a presidential scholarship from SCAD to like, continue shooting and so I used that to go back for a good part of one summer and um keep shooting mm -hmm. um and yeah so that's yeah this is all me yeah but I got tired of you know it, this is not an easy thing to do and you know my partner was a photographer so it helped I always have people ask me about like how can these be self-portraits when you're so far away which I, you know, I'm like, I always teach my students, you know, Cindy Sherman, her father took some of those famous images and Robert Longo took them, those for, those early black and white yeah. eight by tens. Uh, uh, it, it, it's a valid self-portrait if it's your direction and your idea, doesn't matter who clicks the shutter. Oh yeah. Um, but that's okay. something that people don't understand. And this is the only image, and I'll tell you this, that's two images combined the sky and the road. And that was my old driveway, you know. Um, but the, the, the two exposures were very difficult to put together. So I made, I did do this in Photoshop, but it's the only one. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, that's beautiful. That's like the one that seems to really approach being like a, a landscape in the most traditional sense almost, you know? Yeah, like definitely. And I love the, the driveway. Um, oh yeah. The best part, I called this Hope Road for a long time because the name of this road that we lived on was called Hope Road, which I always thought was so funny. That that is very cool. Yeah. And that's just a tree that fell down in my yard. And I decided, you know, 
your location. I'm going to respond to it in a photograph, you know. And That's I, totally I, you beautiful. Know, I was trying to make myself fit into the land. I, I love uh, Anna Mendiata and I love work where women use their bodies like, um, oh, now I'm not going to be able to come up with it. Gertrude Casabare. Am I, <laughs> is that right? Now, who's the woman out west? They just did a huge show of her. No, is it her? Any, anyway, um, she used, you know, she was taking landscape photographs at the same time as all these other, you know, the men, the Westons, et cetera, et cetera. But she was making her body part of the landscape. And I really love that. And so that was part of what I was trying to do here. Mm, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. God, why can't, I'm, it's really bothering me that I can't remember her name, but I can't right now. Now, I would say that even though you were making fun of Ansel Adams early in this lecture, I know, I'm not making fun. I'm just saying, yeah. There is an acknowledgement with these, <laughs> with some of these landscapes of an appreciation of that kind of, you know, Ansel Adams type of thing. Yeah, um, a, four, a four by five camera, you can't help it, you know. Yeah, four by five in the land and, and the landscapes are inherently beautiful. In these, you they know? are, and Maine just is, you know, those trees, I always loved those trees. Um, and this again, this is the only one that's in the winter time. This was the last winter I was there. Um, and I've sold this one a few times because it seems to speak to people somehow. Uh, I would say this could be, you know, the, the, uh, a picture kind of talking about the, the, you know, <laughs> the pandemic. <laughs> this is how I feel about, you know, watching the news about COVID. It's like heavy loads limited. How much can we take, you know? Right. Right. You know, I'm wondering, you know, you bring up like, you know, these were done or at least inspired by the, the era of 9-11. Then suddenly we went through this big major thing this year. The, uh -huh. Do you feel that that suddenly this work can be seen again under the context of what we're all living in now? You know? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I think and, you know, this idea of thinking that certain things make you safe, like a mask or, you know, certain objects make you safe. Um, that's definitely what I was talking about here. And, and this idea of fearing everything, but, you know, you know, I remember when the, you know, when, uh, the pandemic first started happening, it was like, what are we like, uh, we didn't know if we were, I was scared of my groceries, you know, like, um, oh, yeah. you know, everyone yeah. was, didn't know what to be afraid of. And, you know, um, that can be taken lots of ways. Right. Oh, yeah. For sure. Um, uh, this was pretty great to see this uh, this set here. Yeah. And I think that we should, I want to show another project you did, but let's turn this over to the students and see if anyone has, uh, has questions about what we just saw. You know, this kind of, you know, the project on the girls and then the project on yourself and how this was all kind of put together in, uh, you know, in the, uh, exhibition. Oh, I wanted uh, to say, I just want to say Anna Brigman is the woman's name that was really inspiration for me. And there's a picture of her, uh, you know, in the West that is, was kind of like her answer, answer to, um, you know, the male gaze in the landscape, you know, hmm. Anna Brigman, if you don't know her work, they just did a huge uh, retrospective book and show last summer um in santa fe i think it's in santa fe and it's it's her work's kind of amazing and it was very overlooked as far as a woman's body in the landscape or a woman's gaze on the landscape versus the male gaze anyway mm, mm, interesting mm -hmm. interesting the um you know in seeing this like how do you view what your next project would be you know like <laughs> it, would it be something that's an installation and that is you know as as kind of conceptually thought out as what we just saw or do you feel like your next thing would be something more stripped down I mean do you have any thoughts on that mm, I don't know I have I have this weird thing that I don't know what to do with I also love using scanners um uh, I have an idea for the two women that I work with, one of them just retired, but we had a show together at White Space and um, 
we uh, all of our work is very different, but um, we put a show together about women you, you using their bodies to say something, I guess, with art. And so, um, but I have this other, I've been collecting the New York Times that comes every Sunday in a blue bag. <laughs> and I've been collecting it ever since the, the 2016 election. I have, you know, hundreds of them. And I want to do something with those newspapers. Does that make any sense? Um, I started photographing them as a pile. And then people started saying, you know, you've got to get that out of your house. And then I put a sign on it that said, this is an art project. Oh, <laughs> and seriously? now I have them in, you know, I have them all in boxes. I'm not sure what to do with them because it kind of makes me sick to my stomach to look at them because I don't think we knew what was coming in 2016. And, you know, I thought, you know, I have all these pictures of Hillary and Bill Clinton that I did. And I thought, oh, you know, these pictures of Hillary, you know, she's going to be all over the place. And then she wasn't right. Yeah. And the story became something else. And so I'm trying to figure out how to use those newspapers as storytelling. Did you know, have you ever seen uh, Robert Gober's uh, installation where he did photographs? He did drawings on top of the New York Times for 9-11 covers. I have not seen that. They, they're they all about intimacy. Um, and uh, yeah, they're pretty intense. They're, they're beautiful. You know, Robert Gober makes his own New York Times. He has them fabricated. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he made himself the bride in every bridal picture. If you've never seen their... He's amazing and he's an artist that I knew and a lot of my friends worked for him. And um, so the, there's something about the newspaper, the physical newspaper that I, I, I'm not sure what I want to do with it, but I want to do something. And I'm also doing Lumen prints with these suffragette, uh, historic suffragette photographs. <laughs> and then I'm also doing this project about Edna St. Vincent Millay that I've, I've never, I haven't gotten it, to, you know, that's, that's its own thing. Um, because she grew up in the town in Camden, Maine, where I, where I go. And um, I think of her as kind of a real groundbreaker in the sense of she didn't live life the way most people, women were told to at the time. And her poetry is very uh, botanical and, and, you know, oh God, like gritty and not gritty, some of it, some of it's crazy. I mean, it's some of it's, you know, typical poetry, but she's always talk, talking about the landscape. She's the details of a room, for example, or the details of the, the gardens outside. And so I'm doing a project that I call Edna, but I haven't, mm. I haven't really, I was going to work on it this summer, but I'm not doing anything right now. Right. Right. So do you always have a million ideas and then suddenly you focus on one? I have a million ideas until someone tells me to stop and then I need to have a show. And um, oh, I was supposed to, you know, well, yeah, the show is usually the focus. And uh, I was supposed to have a show last year, but obviously that didn't happen. And um, uh, I know I'm going to get Edna. I'm going to tackle her. Um, <laughs> she was a controversial woman you know, and, uh, but that's where the lumen prints that I made are done with the, 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 like the, the fauna and the flora and around the ocean in Maine. I used ocean water to make some of these lumen prints. I'm trying to use the, the space itself. I guess I wanted to do these lumen prints at night with, on the rocks. It with you know, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm open to a lot of things. And then I put them, I combine them together and it's like, oh, that makes sense. But it is, <laughs> it is esoteric storytelling. There's a, there's a guy that does that really well that I love and I can't remember his name right now, but he uses, like he used the phone book in his hometown. Do you know who I mean? Tell me more, maybe. Yeah, no, it, he used the, the phone book. He did another, oh, Redheaded Peckerwood. You know that oh, book? I know. Yeah, Christian um, Christian Peterson or something like yeah, that. Or Christian, anyway, yeah. he does the same sort of not straightforward story storytelling. Storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. 
Last I, uh, yeah, what is his last, Christian Patterson, I think. That's it, name. Christian Patterson. Yeah, I think he's working with Eggleston now or doing something about <laughs> Eggleston. Or something. Oh, I have a whole Eggleston story, but I won't tell it now. Save it for dessert here. Yes. The, um, the, you know, why don't we, because you're talking about the Lumen Prince, why don't you, we look at the last oh, body of okay. work that we were going to share of yours. Okay. Um, and because uh, I have those here put together, uh, lessons in survival. Yeah, and so that's from a Joni Mitchell. Joni, Joni is my boo. I love her. So that's where I came up with that. But uh, I realized see. all these women I was photographing were all surviving something this summer, that summer. And um, that's why it's called that. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. Let me find a way to share this. I'm not sharing my screen now, am I? Nope. No. Okay. Um, are you seeing it now? Yep. The, tell us about this title. Uh, what is the title? <laughs> oh, Lessons in Survival. Oh, I, for the whole thing. Lessons oh, for the whole thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah just that I was... Um, I'm always hanging out with my women friends and um, I realized that every one of them was surviving something. Well, we're all always surviving something. And so I decided, I love that idea of lessons in survival. Um, and um, this is one of the twins. This is one of the girls. Oh, really? Huh. Yeah. Uh, finally nude because she's older and it's her life now. Um, and she can decide she worked with I, I worked with her all some, that summer. And these are the lumen prints that are, you know, like raspberries and cherries and all kinds of healing plants that are around where I was staying. And they also relate to the Edna project. Uh, this is my friend um, with a fig tree um on a you know at a rock star's house um but it's in the land there's a great landscape there because we can use it uh you know freely with nobody's going to be around oh right um, oh you mean take your clothes off you mean yeah yeah um and so and i just love the light and i loved that's my friend jennifer um and these are uh lily you know lily pond uh, whatever these things are called. <laughs> um, oh, lily pads. Yeah. Lily pads. And to me, they look like a uterus or something. And so I have a friend who's who's got ovarian cancer and she's in some of these pictures. And I felt like these related to what she was having to kind of focus on or survive through. Um, mm -hmm. And also, again, uh, you know, these purple co purple colors are the colors of, you know, that kind of represented the suffragettes, the women. Oh, right. So here's a technical question. What type of photographic pa paper do you use for your lumen prints? Oh, just Ilford 8 by 10. I use warm tone sometimes. You know, the ones that are pink are more like, uh, there's warm tone and then there's regular RC. Uh, and the purple ones are the RC and I think the pink is the warm tone. Mm. You know, it's interesting. Your gallery presented this work in a really elegant way that I tried to copy here in this little presentation, where they alternated the, you know, these kind of nudes, portraits, whatever you want to, however you want to title them, with the lumen prints. And I'm wondering if you can elaborate on what you were trying to say by combining these things that are so radically different. Like one is very real and photographic, and one is very. Uh, uh, almost illustrative. Yeah. Um, I think it's more kind of trying to represent spiritual uh, healing. Yeah. Or what goes on in people's minds outside of what's going on with their bodies. I mean, that's something mm. that's very interesting to me is that, and that's where I'm going definitely with my work, um, is this idea of spiritual life and hope and things that get you out of your body. And what's funny is like when I was in the emergency, I was in this horrible emergency room for two days. And I remember I was just, I, they would, I had nothing. And so I just started imagining like, you know, 
like um, fuzzy animals and the things that you do to survive because I didn't get pain medication for eight hours and I was in a bad shape. And I just kept thinking about things outside of my body that I could visualize. And um, for some reason it was like, you know, <laughs> fuzzy animals, <laughs> but these things represent that too. Oh yeah. I mean, to me, they felt like x-rays or they felt like we were looking inside our body at an organ. Yeah, or no, definitely. Some and if you look at my, my Elizabeth Turk's work that's at the High Museum right now in a show called Ex uh, Underexposed about women in photography, it's my body that's in her pictures, but it, they look like x-rays that she's done, but they're full body size Van Dyke prints. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. And so we had these Van Dyke prints next to these really large, realistic photographs of mine. Um, and this is my friend, Vanessa, who's the lead singer of Pylon, the band. And she's also was a nurse. So she took care of me all last weekend. So people mm. were laughing. They were like, oh, your model's here. <laughs> <laughs> but she's very generous. And I would love to do a project with her in total. Um, I have this fantasy of photographing her in complete darkness somehow. How does one do that? I don't know. How did you do these? Mm, they are actually in a swimming pool at my friend's house that has a black slate swimming pool. It's the most beautiful swimming pool you've ever swam in, um, Mr. Stipes. And um, uh, I stay there sometimes and he gave me, you know, he said, I can do whatever I want. And so Vanessa came over and these are medium format digital. So that's why they're, I mean, these prints were 40 by 60, they're huge. Wow. Um, and so I was standing up on a rock, if you can believe it, that acts like a diving board and just photographing her from above. It's all natural light. And it was a challenge for me because all these studio photographers kept telling me, you can't use those medium format digital cameras. You know, you can't take them outside of the studio. And I was They're like- They're hard, yeah. Yeah, and so it was really hard, but I figured out a method to shooting with it. And it were, and I mean, I was shooting somebody that was moving in water. So, um, and I did that a lot that summer. I had this nice camera that I played with all summer long. And that these were the things that I loved the most because they look like they look like paintings. I mean, they're they're very intense to stand in front of this her body. Oh yeah. No, yeah. I can see that. Um, right. no, I love these combinations, though I would say when I first saw them, I didn't I could never figure it out. And then what is this? It's like, is it an intestine or is it a- No, it's oh, a piece of sound? ribbon. So I was photographing, again, this is with the sculptural stuff. Cause I have this whole obsession with ribbon. And then it's also rose hips that are healing, hibiscus. That's what the red stuff is in the water there. And so the ribbons are a whole nother thing that I've done nothing with. And then I just felt it looked like a uterus. I mean, it looks like a body internal organ or a colon or something. And I, I wanted to try to represent the experience that I know a lot of women that I know are having as you get older with your body, you know, you know your body becomes a thing. Hold on, hold on. You know, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for survival. As oh, yeah. Older. And so I wanted to represent it without showing the thing itself. And then I do have a picture of the thing itself, you know, of right. my friend who's had surgery. Right, right. Wow. Um, I think I ended this on this one, uh, just because that was the way your gallery kind of ended it, you know. Um, the... I let me stop these here uh -huh. and the uh, can you shine any light on what your experience has been like after being a working photographer now working with galleries and sharing your work in galleries and uh -huh. um, is this something you enjoy is it frustrating is it rewarding um, oh no I love it I just don't have time to do as much of it as I'd like to you know what I mean um, 
hold on one second. Somebody's asking me something. Um, <laughs> um, um, no, I love, I love doing it. I would do it every day if I could, you know, but teaching mm -hmm. kind of takes up most of my time. Um, right. No, I feel like I've got a lot more to say and to do. Um, and uh, I just hope I have time. I feel like I just got a second chance to try to do it. <laughs> right, right. I, I really, I wasn't, it wasn't Bon Voyage. I've never <laughs> forget laughing about that cake. Um, but no, I have a, a lot. I just hope the thing they told me, they didn't think my fingers were going to move at first. And then the guy said, you've got to tell me when your fingers move. Because, you know, you got to be able to do this. But um, I also am really interested in things that are not photographic. So Sue Ellen and Elizabeth and I are talking about doing a show with no photographs and see what happens with that. <laughs> what would that be? I don't know. Uh, Sue Ellen wants to make our uh, altars. I, I'm still thinking about my newspapers, sculpture. I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, plants. Oh, physical uh, things still, but just not photographic. Yeah, or, or along with photographs, but not just photographic. Because I look at photographs all day long. You know what I mean? And oh, I yeah. feel like there's another way to kind of use them sculpturally that I think a lot of people, you know, what they call haptic art, where you're using like the object itself to make artwork. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. But, you know, I don't have a lot of time to experiment, but I do when I can, for sure. Right. Yeah. Right. Interesting. You know, I think this has been great, Sandra, and I just want to check in with the students. If Does anyone have any questions or observations they want to share with Sandra? <laughs> we do have a lot of students who are doing self-portraits this semester. And oh, so, yeah. for, and I think during quarantine, it was no surprise because so many people, that's all they could shoot, you know, yeah. and, but it seems like it's continued and it isn't, I don't think students are doing it out of default. I think it's the, uh, it just seems like it's, you know, something no, the self-portrait self is it, man. It's everything. It's I'm kind of have, like looking at yourself. Yeah. Ofer, you have a question? Yeah, I have two questions. One completely super stupid technical question. And the other one is about the portraits in the pool. Uh, because I also observed that they look like uh, paintings. Was that, was that intentional or, or did you like see that the skin tone on a back kind of dark background came as accidental after or was this completely intentional to make it look like that? No, I knew what I wanted it to look like. I wanted it to look like she was out somewhere else, not in a pool. I didn't want it to look like a pool because it okay. actually no, does, it 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 actually look, like does look like a pool, but it doesn't look like it in those pictures. Um, there's lines on it and everything. It's a pool. But, um, <clears throat> but I also knew that her body is like a piece of sculpture. And I have a lot of other pictures that, you know, I had to ask, it was also something that you many times have to deal with when you photograph a friend. Um, when I decided like, oh my God, I have to use these. She didn't, you know, she's like, I'll let you do it, but I don't know how I feel about them. And she was posing for me. I didn't like any of that. And so I was like, let's get in the water where you're not posing you can't pose so much right yeah, yeah. and um, but then I had to make these and they're big I mean people were kind of freaked out when they stood in front of them you know like you know Jenny Saville's paintings or something but they're this woman's they're my friend's body and you know I had to go to Athens and show them to her husband <laughs> and he's like she's like Bob doesn't even like it when I share cleavage and I was like well <laughs> Um, I, know, I, just go all and I better them. get his permission about this and I got her permission at first she was a little like you know because she's a person too I mean she's a, a personality like a known you know lead singer of a band and so I was like I want you to be comfortable with this but they're just so beautiful I mean I knew it when I took them I was I I was just like in stunned at what her body looked like in the water and you know. then the, the technicality of that photo, uh, how did you shoot from above? 
I, like I said, I was standing on a rock that's like a, this oh, huge okay, like rock the, that yeah, okay. you dive into the swimming pool instead of a diving board, it's a rock. And so okay. I was, she was right underneath me. And so I thank God, you know, I didn't fall in the water, but um, I had to, you know, she had to keep kind of coming, you know, like shooting in water is not easy. And Everything's moving. Yeah, like those other images where Isabel is in the uh, seaweed, like I fell down a few times because um, that seaweed is really, uh, really slippery. And so you have to be, I mean, I, it was crazy what I was doing. I mean, and she was like, <laughs> she got floating by me and that water is like frigid, but we swim in it every day when I'm up there. But she was willing to keep, because I knew exactly where I wanted her to be but it wasn't easy to get her with the tide and the ocean. And, you know, I don't, I, you know, I certainly won't be doing that now, but I love shooting like that where it's kind of, of course, and we were doing that with people around and they were just, you know, <laughs> what are you doing? But oh, yeah, yeah um, it, you know, but it, with Vanessa, it was a more controlled environment because it was a swimming pool and there was nobody there. Thank you. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. but it's certainly not commercial photography it's like uh what's happening with the light that day at that time and i always have to be ready to shoot so i i take a lot of pictures that you don't see all oh, right you're not lighting it and figuring it out you're dealing with what you have in front of you yeah i don't like lighting things and that's from journalism because i learned i didn't have time when i do those portraits i didn't have time to set up lights often you know, and like when you're doing celebrities, they're like, hey, you got five minutes, you know, oh, yeah. and it's like, OK, so I figured out how to do stuff like that with like I, I used to use hotel room window. I mean, everybody does it. Um, but I figured that natural light is more pleasing to me. I don't like lighting things, although I say that, but I and I used a flash for years, but um, I don't light them. No. Right. Right. Anna Rose, you had some comments in the beginning of the lecture. The, I was just wondering if you had anything you wanted to share or any particular questions. You know, I'm curious. First of all, your work is really inspirational. I love Thank you. how you, yeah, I love how you take different elements um, from your life and poetry and different things and mix, weave that in as well as the the ways to obstruct the, when you're working, now I know you use the medium format, but also when you're working with like the DSLR to um, obstruct the, you know, create in camera something really unique and beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things I was thinking, cause you in the beginning said that you wanted to do photography, but you thought, no, I need to do some, like have a real job or whatever your <laughs> comment was toward that. So what, what is your advice or direction with that? Like, obviously as a, as a professor too, you might have some information, but mm -hmm. with the fine artwork, is that something you just do as a passion, but then keep your teaching job? Or how do you how do you infuse the two and how do you survive with the two? Because there's being an artist and there's also supporting yourself as well. Yeah, yeah the teaching takes over a little too much, I would say. And so I try to, because that's a creative act too. You know, that's a creative effort. And a lot of people don't realize that. And I put everything into my students. Uh, work, especially the, you know, the ones that are really trying to get something, get somewhere. But um, that's why I try to preserve some part of, usually it's the summer or some part of the year where I'm still teaching, I'm teaching online, but I'm not with people all, because being with people all day long makes it hard to be creative and a mom. Um, um, but, and then as far as like making a living goes, I think teaching is a great way to do it but it it does take creative energy but um the other thing i found out because i just wrote a class uh for e-learning and um i think if i was starting over now i might you know become a photo editor because um i love you know just like teaching is the same thing like i can edit down people's projects or get way into that it's hard for me to do for myself sometimes but um, I love looking at photographs clearly. Um, and I love 
you know, trying to make something out. Like a lot of times I can put things because I did work as a photo editor at The Voice. Um, I learned how to put things together that makes something make sense. And I love doing that. And I've met some really young photo editors um, when I was writing this class. And I thought that would be an interesting job these days because you know, they're doing like storytelling with multimedia and little pieces of movement, but not still photographs. Um, that that seems really interesting to me, but I, you know, I, I'm too far into it now to, you know, <laughs> change to become a photo editor. But I think I, I would have been a good curator too, because I love like every, every year I put together the senior project show. And I love doing that stuff. I mean, I love standing in a room and figuring out how do you make it look like something. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It, it does. Thank you. Uh huh. Good question. I like your photographs behind you. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the, you know, it's interesting. We always talk about careers in this class. You know, I've asked the students to yeah. think of careers for themselves. And it's interesting you brought up photo editor. What do you feel like your students, you know, on the East Coast, upon graduating, what are, what are they considering as, as careers? Well, a, a lot of them have freelance, you know, Atlanta is hip hop central. So if you want to photograph portraits, uh, there's a lot of them here. Um, and then I'm trying to think of, and then I have my, I told you my two photojournalist I call them my babies, but they're not babies. They're Joshua, you should look up Joshua Rashad McFadden. He, I mean, to see him go from somebody who had this idea to like what he's doing now, but his work was always about race and, um, you know, being a, an African-American in America, but he is just so amazing. And some people just have that way of being a photojournalist that tells stories. And he did something for, he's working for Smithsonian. Like they took his MFA thesis show and Smithsonian copied it, had him copy it for their story about the garbage men in uh, Memphis that Martin Luther King was helping to, uh, you know, they were demonstrating when he was killed. And um, it's really interesting to see somebody's style put to buy a magazine into a story. And so, mm -hmm. Um, and then Nicole is a photojournalist. There are a lot of, you know, freelancing is really hard work. And I say it's for the young and it's for people that aren't supporting an entire family. <laughs> but if you can do that for a while, you should do it. And then portrait photography. I have students that work for Atlanta Magazine. Like those things still exist, Atlanta Magazine. Um, and I'm just always amazed at how much enthusiasm people have when a lot of the work that we knew, like I, you know, I used to could send my students to The Voice um, as a way to move forward, right? Now it's a little bit different, but, um, but, you know, The Voice is coming back and I've had a couple of people ask me, you know, like, what do you think it would be kind of fun to like see if it's real when it comes back as an investigative journalist like I would like to be out doing that kind of work, um, especially in the South right now. The South right now is where it's at as far as stories go, storytelling. Um, there's so much going on here, you know, and it's like Atlanta is this weird convergence of everything. Um, and it is the birthplace of the civil rights movement and you can feel it here. Um, that's what's interesting and you know I photographed I actually went to the protest last summer on the edges you know with Joshua and with Nicole but I didn't get into this you know in deep into the heart of it but like I went to John Lewis's funeral with Nicole and got a nice photograph on the bridge because I really wanted to be there but to me the moment of watching what happened when they brought him over that bridge oh my god it's gonna make me stop start crying because it was just so intense. All these women just started singing the civil rights songs that they would sing walking over that bridge. And it was like, it suddenly got so quiet. And then the, the casket just stopped on the middle of the bridge. And I've, it, all she could hear was the crickets and people singing. It was intense. Like to me, it wasn't about the photograph. It was about that moment. 
Um, and it, it was a moment. And so Nicole, my student, was working for the Times and they had told her to get on the other side of the bridge. And the other photographer that day was already there. And so he was like, you can't come over here, I've got this. And she was like, damn it, I'm gonna get this picture. And she figured out a way to get to the rooftop of the building over the bridge, got the most amazing photograph. And I was like, boy, I'm glad that was your job today and not mine. Um, <laughs> she got what I think is the most beautiful picture of that, of his, of him in that carriage on the top of that bridge of that day. Mm. Yeah, so I have a lot of respect for doing that kind of work, but it's a, like Larry Fink says, you're not a documentary photographer because you want to make money. <laughs> you're, it's a calling and you're going to work so hard to get what you know is there. And that takes, you know, that takes a lot of guts. It's not just war photography that's like that. It's like figuring out how to be somewhere in a room and say something in the room um, is not for everybody and it's hard work. And I used to do it and I used to be good at it, sneaking into places and getting around people and not listening to them and getting the, what I wanted. But I'm not working that way these days. So, um, but I say, go out and try it. Some people are really meant to do that kind of work, you know, and it's, there's sure. definitely, I have another student in LA named Tara Lynn Pixley, and she has a lot to do with women photograph, um, with uh, the Photographer's Bill of Rights. She's also working a lot and it's all kind of self-driven work. And she's also a full-time professor. Uh. Um, but, you know, she has tenure and, you know, sabbaticals and all these nice things. Um, but she's, she's very interesting and she was a student of mine too. Her name's Tara Lynn Pixley. And she's somebody to know. You should follow her on Instagram because she's on the front lines of kind of like, you know, what they're what they're calling, you know, colonialism in photography and addressing this inequality that I always experienced. You know, I was not a kid of money. And I would go to New York City and it felt like everybody <clears throat> had enough money to fly to South Africa and photograph Nelson Mandela. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> how can you do that you know like yeah. so I always had to have very economic means I had one two cameras you know and I say you can do it without much and the one thing I, I got I, I interviewed James Estrin who was my photo editor at the New York Times Jim Estrin mm -hmm. and he said I don't want to hear that that uh that only one type of person can tell one story you know, he's like, I don't, you know, and he's the old, you know, white man saying that. But at the same time, he's like, I'm always interested in anybody's story from any point of view, because that's, that's your, that's that person's point of view. And that, that any, every story should be told from every point of view. And that that's <clears throat> what, that's what needs to be changed. That the point of view needs to be given to many more different people. <clears throat> but that, that your point of view isn't valid. You know, the, don't think that you can't shoot something because you're not of it. Right. But that was his advice. And I thought it was pretty interesting advice. Yeah, yeah. No, for any storyteller, for sure. Yeah, for anybody that's trying to tell stories, um, that that's important to understand that your story is always your own and nobody else has done it yet. And, you know, and nobody can tell your story but you. That's good. Yeah. That's good. That's inspirational, Sandra. I think we can let you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Thank uh, it you. was great I'm to gonna... kind of hear the story behind these things. Yeah. The, thank I... you very much. Thank you for Sandra. all for coming. I just feel like I taught a class. Um, <laughs> I, I remember how, you know, yeah, I, I haven't done this all summer long. So thank you. This was a, a nice little, you know, Reminder. <laughs> we didn't want you to get rusty from teaching. So we oh, no. This. Yeah. oh no, I gotta, I gotta be ready for the fall. That's right, um, that's right. Yeah, well, thank you all for coming and I'm glad you appreciate the work so much. I need to promote it a little bit more or something, but you know, I feel like that will come. Absolutely, absolutely. Sandra, we are going to let you go. Thank you so much.